Welcome to Granite Creek Studios. This is The Art of Faith. My name is Joshua Kapczynski and my co-host Joel Fairley. And Welcome. we are talking about the intersection of art and faith. And today we're going over my top five versus Joel's top five works of art. For now. For now. <laughs> this was a very difficult subject yeah. to go after. And Joel's like, can I have an honorable mention? Uh, can I have a couple more honorable mentions? So this was probably harder for him than it was for me. Um, I but, told my wife of our assignment, and I told her my favorite. She laughed at you. She laughed. Well, how come you didn't have these? Oh, jeez. So we've each picked five works of art that mean something to us or that we find impressive. What we're really going after is how do these works of art inform our faith? which is probably a harder question to ask because sometimes I just like stuff. So, yeah. And I guess that's okay, right? It's absolutely okay. But the, the, the thing is, in order for it to be affect us as a, as a Christian artist, it has to have a Christian meeting. That's, yeah. that's the old school way of thinking. Yeah. And they don't often do that. Yeah. Beauty affects us. That, that is, uh, that, it does. And I think that that's how God's wired us. Um, we're unique in that. That's how. Yes. That's how we're wired. That God. Yeah. He He wants us to be moved by, by beauty or, or by art. So anyway, that's what makes us human. Absolutely. All right. So um, we're going chronologically, and so I picked my first five. Um, my first one's really old. Like, really, really, really old. How old are we talking about? Okay, so this is controversial. Uh, my first few paintings, it's not an artist. Don't know who these, who this person was or who these people are. Uh, but this is prehistoric cave art. And from what the experts have said, it's somewhere between forty to 50,000 years old. Shut up! I know. So uh, there's two caves. Uh, they're, they're finding other pieces, but the two famous wow. caves are the Chevelle, Chevet Caves and the Lascaux Caves in France. And uh, recent discoveries, uh, relatively recent discoveries, mm -hmm. uh, they're all sealed up. They don't allow humans in there without old, you know, full body suits and everything. Oh. So it's, it's they're, they know what they have. It's they, hermetically they, sealed. It's hermetically sealed. And I don't know, for me, the older is better. So I'm always, you know, it, it can be a problem, but I'm fascinated with ancient culture, ancient history, and again, older the better. I'm just fascinated by it. But these works of art at 50,000, 60,000 years old, um, it poses a problem for Pastor Josh and Pastor Joel in the area of evangelical Christianity. Uh, why why do these dates, why do they pose a problem, Pastor Joel? <sighs> because it doesn't fit in the window of the young earth young earth theory. Yep. And the creationists who yep. date the earth according to Genesis 1 and the yep. calendar of Genesis 1. We don't have time to get into creationism at the moment, but... I'm an old earth creationist. I believe Joel is an old earth creationist. I, yeah, yeah. I, I believe, um, put it this way, it's, um, it's as old as when God started it. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So these pieces, th these pieces are, are a big deal in the art world because it is showing us that prehistoric man had the capability to not only reproduce images uh, in some ways to scale, but he's doing something, the artists are doing something with the images that is highly advanced. Okay, so the first piece that we're looking at right now, uh, these are lions, so prehistoric lions. I would like to say that maybe Adam and Eve saw these, who knows? Um, mm -hmm. but they're old and at first glance you look at these lions and they're layered on one on top of another 
Mm-hmm. Um, wow. There, you. Some would say that maybe they're. See, in my opinion, they don't look juvenile to me. They look very. I, I don't know. I think they're really well done. They don't oh, they're do, very well done. Yeah, and they don't feel they don't feel like abstractions. But well, initially, what you notice is that there's like one lion head on top of another uh-huh. li- lion head, and um, well, let me get your opinion about about the well, technique. Well, a first, part of me says as an artist, as, as an artist um, you know, when I sketch, you know, there's for every painting that I have in my studio or I have on my wall that I painted. There's about, you know, seven or a whole, almost a whole book of, of sketches, mm-hmm. trying to find the image that I need. Right. And so, from from my point of view as an artist, what I see this is, is an artist finding the image, finding right. the space, and finding that. So um, they're working it out. They're working it out. Yeah. Um, same idea. Same idea. So different one. Um, yeah. Again. Lions on top of lions, at yeah. least their heads, and then and and I have to tell you, as an experienced artist and one who has painted some lions, yeah, a, little, a few lions, um, the one on the extreme, that one coming out on the stream right hand side, yeah, is to me as far as the head is concerned, is that anatomically correct? Proportions are yeah, the proportions are fab. And again, this fab. is fab. I mean, this is this is this is prehistory. Yeah, baby. <laughs> um, if again, these are dated at fifty thousand, approximately yeah. fifty thousand years old. Um, works that humans were doing, let's say, five thousand BC, were very rudimentary. They weren't this advanced. Mm-hmm. So these ancient people were advanced in their techniques, and these are deep, deep, deep underground. Mm-hmm. So my imagination wow. goes to okay, if they're doing this underground. What were they doing above ground? Like, what pieces did we lose? Because, yeah, yeah, there's part of it. Yeah, I think that, that they're probably working it out. But I also, there's another theory that they're doing something else. So this oh, is, wow. So this is a rhino. And there's two oh, rhinos. Wow. They're not laid up on top of each other. But no. look at the horns and look at the shoulders. And what does, Joel, what does that look like to you? Oh, it looks like we There's have a rhino. A movement. A movement, yeah. exactly. So in, in one case, they're working it out. They're making their lines better. Yeah. Um, but the theory is specifically on the rhino, and if you take a different look, let's say, at the, le- at the lions. Uh, oh, those horses are really pretty. I like horses. Uh, oh. um, and then they did, did the same thing with horses. Yeah. What, what the thought is, is that inside of the cave, with the flicker of light and the way that they have them staggered on top of one another, they are they're messing around with movement. So you could even say trying this, to recreate the movement. Yeah, yeah. So you could say that this is the first cartoon. Oh, this is this, this is the first motion picture. Animated. Yeah, and so they they might have even used. They know that they were using uh, whistles on strings inside of these caves, either ceremonial or for entertainment. And there's thoughts that maybe they were, you know, messing around with the light, with you mm-hmm. know, you know, they were making it, making their their, their light come on and off. Yeah, to, to exactly. put movement on the animals inside wow. the cave. So anyway, I I don't really have any uh, connection to Jesus with these, with the exception that they're fabulous in my opinion. And, and again, older the better. Well, and when did you first come? When did you first become aware of these? I would say probably about ten years ago, and then I just started. Ten years ago. Yeah. When you were younger. When I was younger, but, but after college for sure. Okay. okay. Uh, I don't even know if they were discovered when I was in college. Um, okay. I did. I was an art history major. Surprise, surprise. But um, art history major with the emphasis in, in art, specifically ancient and Near East art. Okay. And again, wow. and I got sucked into the older the better. And um, so anyway, well, I, it's I, easy to do. Yeah. But yeah. So, but so this has in, informed your early adult appreciation. Yeah, and one of the ways that I like to think about it in, the, in terms of history, because again, this, in my opinion, is advanced, and I'm not, it's not just my opinion. 
it's other professional anthropologists, apologists, and artists' opinion. Like, like they're blown away by this stuff. So one of the one of the theories is is that were were they better? Was was hum, humanity better at fifty thousand years ago? And have we kind of gone downhill? Have we not evolved, but have we devolved since this period? So it's a great, it's a really good question to ask in in terms of the fall. So. Uh, Adam and Eve being the perfect humans, you know, and then like they were the closest to the image of God that we have, and oh, yeah. and then so what happened since? I and so there's that theory of okay, are we devolving? And well, I think I think at least socially, I think the bottom line is yeah, what happened yeah. is is when sin enters into our lives and stuff. Yeah. I think when when Adam and Eve displayed their out and out disobedience to God. Yeah. And after saying, I'm gonna take care of you, you have all mm -hmm. of this, you take it upon yourself and you know good at, he took his hands off. Yeah. Kicked him out of the garden, out of that place of development. Yeah. You're on your own. And so what we see is the struggle is real. Yeah. And, and, and the bottom line is, is it's really interesting. It's almost as if God put innately in us um, innately in us a way to get back to him. Yeah. Yeah. Because he is creative. Yeah. We, in my opinion, and I feel that that's what it means to be created in the image of God, to have something that no other creature has. And so Which they, is the ability to do what God does, to create. To create, yeah. not to be God, yeah, yeah. With but to create. Yeah. That's what this is. Yeah. And I think ancient man is finding their way back into the beauty of who God is. Yeah. On an on a instinctive level. They, yeah. may not, they may not articulate it like right. that. I'm getting back to God, so yeah, I'm going to draw a picture. Good. All right, let me do my next one, because I'm still in the ancient world, and I Where know that yours is... We're good. You're you're in AD, so I'm still in BC here. So <laughs> I love it. My next one is uh, an interpretation of higher art, of classical art. Uh huh. So um, you know we have the idealistic, idealized super gods of the Greeks. You know the mm -hmm. the Zeus and the Apollo and the mm -hmm. Aphrodite, and those are our go-to's whenever we want to be inspired by classic art. Mm -hmm. So this one is a little bit beyond the age of classical art. Okay. And he's called the Boxer. And this is around 200 BC. So he's an athlete. <laughs> wow. And I saw this piece when I was a boy. Oh boy. Uh, at the Getty. And uh. and again I went through the galleries looking at the Aphrodites and the, the classical uh, Greek pieces or the Roman reproductions of Greek pieces. And the boxer is special because it, it, it is at the end of the classical period and we're moving into the Hellenistic period. Yeah. And it's much more realistic and expressive. I don't have the close-ups of it to you, that you can see, but uh, this guy, although he has got the great physique, he's beat up, he's tired, his yeah. nose is broken, he's got cuts. Oh, wow. He's physically exhausted, and so we get the we get the realism, <laughs> and relatively a very. I mean, this is 200 BC. Uh -huh. It's really advanced, and it's all oh, bronze. absolutely, it's all bronze, and it's just incredible. The fatigue on his face. Yeah, it's almost like you know he's looking, looking at his cut man. Yeah, and. You yeah, know, looking like looking up at him, and you he know, says, "What do you mean? I've been trying to stay yeah. away from him." <laughs> he, it, it's uh, he's like Conor McGregor after Justin Portier just beat him up. I yeah, mean, he's this, you know, he's like, "Oh, I just gone through it." Um, Great. I saw it when I was a boy at the Getty Villa, and uh -huh. I remember just being, you know, drawn to it. And then, I think probably the one of the reasons why I brought it up today is because I saw it at the New Getty. Um, a few years ago, yeah, again. and it just it it brought back all those memories, all those feelings of mm -hmm. when I first saw him as a boy. 
Yeah. And then I get to see him again as a as an as an adult man. So I just I think it's really cool. And I, I don't know. It, I just remember it. You know, usually when you're a boy and you have to go to a museum, it's like it. It's boring. It sucks, right? Yeah. You know, you're on a field trip. It's just trip a or notch whatever. above the trip to yeah. the post office. But this this piece moved me as a boy. Wow. And it was, that's kind of one of the the starting points of my fascination with art because I just like couldn't wow. st- couldn't stop looking at them. And then if you get close, you'll appreciate this better than I do. But the details are, mm. you know, every little line, every little cut inside the mm. the bronze is just immaculate. The attention to detail. And then, of course, the expression of the emotions. Loved it. All right, there's my first two. So let's do yours next. Um, mine is Rembrandt. Yeah. And um, I, I'm sad to say that as uh, I, I'm as a child, I was not impressed with old, you know, paintings, yeah. and, and I wasn't aware of it. But this, this. Um, I grew an appreciation for Rembrandt more as an adult at a trip to the Getty, and this, I think this is in the new Getty in the Rembrandt ring. And this, I saw this old man looking at me Mm -hmm. across the room. And this is entitled Old Man in a Military Costume. Yeah. I was drawn in by the face and this this could easily have been a photograph. Yeah. Absolutely. Easily. Yeah. And it wasn't. Um, it was, you know, it was mid what um mid 17th century. Mm-hmm. And the the thing that just blows me away is I got up close to the eyes. Right. And I've seen old man's eyes like that. So he's got some life. He's got some life. And Rembrandt experience. The thing I love about Rembrandt is he's he's great at um, shadow and light. Uh-huh. He's probably one of the best ones at it, and and he it works real well. And um, and I I think that you know you and I are you you and I in the spiritual realm work mm-hmm. with contrast. Yeah, we yeah. work in the dark and the light. Yeah, yeah. We're probably um, too acquainted for our own good. <laughs> with, well, yeah, with, with the dark, but we know we know ne- know where to go for the light. Yeah. Um, but look at the metal. Yeah, the metal's incredible. Look um, at this. The the uh. Yeah, it's it is it does look like a photo, and then that's a real person. Mm-hmm. So if you were to take his hat off and take his armor off and put a suit and tie on him. Yeah, you know he would be a middle manager yeah. or a CEO of some sort. Easily, well, he's, I've I've seen this. I've seen that face yeah. in in the facilities that my my wife works at sure. in in elder care. Sure, sure. Yeah, and his beard, the gray in his beard, mm-hmm. is done so effectively. And so Rembrandt, um, Rembrandt also. Um, Made, I think he was the first one of classical paintings that made Jesus real for me. He seated a lot of religious. Yeah, work. he. There was yeah. a lot of there was a lot of liberties um, that people took with Jesus, you know, that to a play, and they're fine, and I know yeah. what they're trying to do. He, to me, and and just as this, he's. Um, He's he's taking the bric-a-brac. He's taking the garbage off it yeah. and saying this is this is who it is. And I, that's what I appreciate about it. It's very simple, yeah. and the colors work. I love the I love the palette of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it. It's very muted, but he uses he uses the browns and everything around to highlight to highlight the face. And the face is the most important yeah. thing in this painting, even to the place where, see that bright light around the collar of mm-hmm. the, of that um, steel armor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See that right under his chin. There's that that piece of white. Yeah. And that's, and that's almost as if he's to me. He's almost as if he's trying to using that to shine a spotlight on the face. Yeah, yeah. And it's just. 
He did just, that when he painted gold too. Yeah. yeah it just he nails gold. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't I don't know if this is accurate, but I think it, I heard it said that Rembrandt was the first modern painter. So I, I don't know. Uh, Could anyway. be. I just like him. Yeah, yeah. I I, I like him. I think he I think I think he um, he to me I think he romanticized um, ordinary people. He's famous for Night Watch, which everybody knows. And then what was that one uh, Sea of Galilee painting that was stolen? That that's fascinating. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. And he has and his and his self portraits are just an absolute delight yes. to look at. Have you ever done self portraits? Oh yeah. You you have. Oh yeah. Okay. I'll show you sometime. All right. That's, some have be worked. another show. Some have worked. And some not. <laughs> some not. All right. Mine number three is in the same period. Oh, close your eyes, Joel. There it is. There it is. Oh, see. Uh, so actually, a little bit before Rembrandt. This is Caravaggio coming out of. So he would have preceded Michelangelo and Da Vinci and all those guys. So this a little bit before Rembrandt, a little after. Uh -huh. Michelangelo. Now this one definitely is a piece that has informed my faith. So this is the conversion of St. Paul. And, you know, Caravaggio kind of coming off of the old world masters who were, you know, they'd paint more classical. In a sense, this is another expression of the boxer because it's, a, it's, it's conveying emotion it's dramatic. Physicality. It, it, there's physicality taking place. This isn't, you know, him painting Paul on his back um, is it hasn't it wasn't done before. Uh, like literally laying under his horse in the state of ecstasy. Absolutely. Yeah. So total surrender. Yeah. So when I whenever I think of the road um, to Damascus. Of course, I think of the big giant blinding light, but that's the emotion that I that I feel from reading Acts and reading the story of Paul being knocked off of his horse. So it is, it, you know, there's a, a state of complete surrender wow. and brokenness. And wow. there's a little this detail that Caravaggio does too, in that um, he is painting him in, wearing actually Roman gear because uh -huh. uh, he. Although he was a Jew, he was kind of working for the Romans and yeah. persecuting Christians. Yeah. So it's fascinating. And, you know, like Rembrandt, he uses light well. So you see the shades and the shadows. The horse is lit up well. And, but you see the backside of the horse dark, and there's darkness yeah. under the horse. It, that's, it, that's what's fascinating to me about this is because um, you said, you know, we all know it's, it's, it's the blinding light struck him down. Yeah. And... And it's in, it's interesting. It's not it's not landing on Paul. Mm -hmm. So the only indication there's a bright light is indicated on the horse. Yeah. And if if as an artist we were trying to to make it, you mm -hmm. know, most of us do is try to make it, you know, coming out of the corner of the painting yeah. and shining down on that. Yeah. And then you miss, but then you miss a detail. You'd have to cover up the detail of the companion. Yeah. And and his emotional stress is just as important into the painting as anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so the light is reflected on the horse that this blinding light is coming. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. I just love it. The other thing I like about it is from a charismatic pastor's perceptive uh -huh. perception, like I can relate to this. Yeah. You know, you take the ancient gear off of him, you take the horse out of the picture, you put a t-shirt and some jeans on this kid, and it's like you're at a revival meeting. So, or in my, or in your church, or yeah. in my parents' living yes. room, where so, my br brother prayed over me. Yeah, yeah. So, we, in, in charismania, we call this doing carpet time. So, oh. or being slain in the spirit. <laughs> carpet time. Carpet time. I prefer carpet time than slain in the spirit. I've spent some carpet time. Yeah, but this is what's this is what's going on. Yeah, he, he's slain in. That's the spirit. awesome. It's awesome. And you know, he kind of wakes up later, and he's got yeah. the scales on his eyes. It's it's transformational. Uh, incidentally, Caravaggio was a big jerk, but he captures this well, you know. Well, I got a jerk on my list. I'm too. sure, <laughs> I'm sure you do. Um, but it captures it beautifully. Yeah. So my next one is 
Van Gogh. Yes. And um, and I became acquainted with him, you know, through the beauty of Don McLean, that song. Okay. And then that yeah. that connected me to to him. And then I was at the Getty, and this one arrested me in mm -hmm. the middle, and I said, "That's Van Gogh." Mm -hmm. And I went up to look at that, and and to look at the canvas. It was the first time I was able to appreciate the artist up close and personal. Yeah. And um, almost that's, got in trouble. Huh? You almost get in trouble. You almost, I almost got in trouble. Yeah. Um, somebody had to tell me back away. Mm -hmm. But what I loved is when I was looking at the irises, I was, I was, um, I saw the canvas that the paint is on. I mm -hmm. saw the weave of the canvas. Yeah. And those of us who are artists are very familiar with the magic of the weave because we make the weave work for us one way or another. Do we have a heavy brush stroke yeah. over that so we can keep the pattern or do we or do we not? But then is heavy use of paint. Yeah. It's just it's breathtaking and it's it, beautiful. It's, and um, if you've never seen a Van Gogh, the thickness of the paint is a lot thicker than it than it looks on it's, screen. It's astoundingly it's just, thick. Yeah. They call it impasto, is that what they call yes. it? Yeah. Yeah. Big, so he, he just cakes big, it big on. lumps. And he painted with like trowels too, right? Didn't he just like... Yeah. yeah. Part of it was, yeah, they call it palette knife, but I think yeah. he did both. There are, there are, I mean, he, he used both. And from what I understand, it's, it's real quick. This is, this is just... Just go. I, I, to to start to go on and on is is to be false and it's fawning, and I would rather just let it speak for itself. Yeah, it's it's in, it's it, it's incredible. And again, the colors are popping. Uh, and, yeah, and sometimes when you see something beautiful, you have to shut up. <laughs> so there uh, we go. The I'm irises. Shut up. There you go. Yeah. So Van Gogh. Van Gogh. All right. Well, let's go to okay. your, you have a Van Gogh. I have a Van Gogh. I know that I've seen this painting before, but tell us. This, what... is, this is the Good Samaritan. It's, um, he based it off of a Delacroix painting. So mm -hmm. here's the Delacroix. Okay. And so the same idea, Good Samaritan, he's putting the guy on the horse. If you look in the distance, you can see the priest walking away. Yeah. And so Van Gogh, this is his interpretation. There's his priest. Yeah. So this is his interpretation of the Delacroix, it's mirrored, so it's the opposite. So the horse is on the other side, the guy's on the other side. Yeah. So he, he flipped it. Um, and then, well, the color is incredible. The blues and the yellows yeah. and the greens. And then you, you can clearly see the agony of, uh, of the person that's, that he's, that he's got you... picked out of the ditch and oh, he it... getting saved. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then you know the in, the the priest that's walking away, you just kind of feel like he's clearly turning his back and a little ominous there. It um, what's what what gets me about this painting that I love, and um, first of all, as an artist, I never met a color I didn't like. So, <laughs> um, so, so the. Uh, it, it, what's arresting me and it's it halts me is the red in the hat mm -hmm. of the Samaritan mm -hmm. that is like a huge big stop sign yeah. that says pay attention mm -hmm. like you can't walk past a gallery yeah because that gets your attention right away and I like I love how Van Gogh gets our attention with color and 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 I think one of the greatest creations of God is color. Yeah, it's we've had a conversation. Of, we share Van Gogh as one of our favorites. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably Absolutely. my top one or top. Probably two. my top one. If you put a yeah. gun to my head, who yeah, are you going to pick? I think so. And well, he painted some religious stuff. Uh, have you seen his chapel or the church one? Yeah, oh yeah. That yeah. one's creepy, but it's so good. I oh mean, yeah. It's like, I, I, he's not just painting a church. He's he's telling a story. He's mm -hmm. like saying this place is jacked up, 
It's there's monsters in the church. Yeah, there's there's this place is haunted. Yeah. Um, most people might not know that Van Gogh was in ministry, and so yeah. uh, his earlier work that doesn't, where he's not playing around with color like this, and you know it, it's a yeah. little more traditional and very monochromatic. So yeah. lots of potato browns, eaters, a great example eaters, of it. Potato um, eaters, it, it's you know darker. It doesn't pop with color. Uh, during that period, he was technically in ministry, and uh-huh. he was serving the poor and got in trouble for serving the poor. Imagine that. He got in trouble for being nice. And so they, they, they kicked him out of ministry. Well, just being nice, yeah. just but doing he, what Jesus would do. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he, he painted, um, yeah. uh, so he worked with miners. Uh, oh. He painted Canary in the, in wow. the mine yeah. during that time. Um, and We've miners in terms of people who go down in the into dirt the mine, and, and yeah. into the mine yes. not, not yeah yeah uh, but yeah so he clearly not had underage a underage people <laughs> I, he had a heart for god mm-hmm. and it usually doesn't get communicated whenever they're making a movie about van gogh mm-hmm. and it, it's it's tragic that they don't talk about his faith mm-hmm. because clearly that was an important part but and what do you, they focus on what him being crazy. Him being crazy. Yeah. Chopping his ear off or part of yeah. his ear. That's why I think um, Don McLean's song, Vincent, which is about him, and that's what really um, fished me in, if yeah. you would, into him. That's why his song is so brilliant, because he he captures the beauty of who he was in that song, but also the tragedy of it. Mm-hmm. And the, the thing is, is I think... The wonderful thing about him is this is this is gorgeous. He's a yeah. fantastic painter, but broken as hell. Yeah, he, and he reminded me of this that he didn't sell anything, right? He sold one painting. Sold in, one painting his entire life and his whole life. Just, but and, he he kept painting. Yeah, but he was he was just broken, yeah. and. And the thing is, I wish, you know, I hope I, I'm, well, I'm going to meet him in heaven. Yeah. And I just want to tell him how, <laughs> how, how important he was to me. Yeah. You know, and I know, I know that you suffered and you couldn't make sense out of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And they couldn't make sense of you. They couldn't. And, I mean. And when no hope was left inside on that starry, starry yeah. night, you took your life as lovers often yeah. do. It's it's so bizarre. I mean, another another thing you might not know is that, well, you know this, but maybe you, those that are listening, is that one of the reasons why he did go crazy is he was mixing paint in his mouth. And you told me as an artist you'd probably do the same thing. I'd probably do the same, like, same thing. But my so, my paint, you know, my paint isn't lead based. Yeah. So he was dealing with lead poisoning, and yeah, I discovered that Caravaggio was also. Most likely lead poison. Wow. That's why he was angry and violent. Wow. But anyway. So. Yeah, gotta love Van Gogh. Yep. All right. Um, Me? Yeah. Okay. Um, my guy, the next one, is um, is not an artist per se, but is known more as an illustrator. Okay. And this is this is the patriarch of the Wyeth clan. This is N. C. Wyeth. Um, and he is the father of Andrew Wyeth and Jamie Wyeth. So Andrew Wyeth has got this famous painting of the gal in the yes. field looking at the house. Yes. He is he has been he considers the the greatest American painter of the latter half yeah. of the 20th, 20th century. Yeah. And so this is his dad. This is his father, N.C. Yeah. Wyeth, and he painted in the heyday of what is called the golden age of illustration. Okay. And he is known as an illustrator, and he painted around the turn of the century. He was killed in an automobile accident along with one of his sons uh, in mm. 1945. Wow. And N.C. Wyeth, and I, the reason why he's one of my favorites is because of all the books and stories that I loved. It was inadvertently, I don't know why, but it was always accompanied by his illustrations yeah. Swiss Family Robinson yeah. Three Musketeers got it Robin Hood Robin Hood Robin Hood and to me he 
he this is what adventure looked like through his eyes through his eyes he and um and and not in this part this is a self portrait of him but if we if, his other works do we have his other works let's see here yeah, that's him. That's, that's him. All right. That's that's your doppelganger. Good looking guy. Good looking guy. <laughs> All right. And uh, here we go. So this is yeah, this is his um, Arthur at the lake, um, receiving Excalibur. So cool. And so cool. And another one. And this is this is one he did in a series of of for the magazine Ladies Home. Um, I think it was no, it was Good Housekeeping. Hmm. And this, uh, he did a series of children from the Bible. Hmm. And this, of course, is David and Goliath. Yeah. The reason why I love this so much is, uh, first of all, the subject of it, children in the Bible, is muted mm -hmm. compared to the rest right. of them. Right. Look, look what he does with the, the background, the sky, the clouds. Yeah. All at it, all this color on it. And, and then the heroes and, shaded. And, and the heroes are shaded, but the target is, and this whole, but it still frames the whole thing beautifully. And I just, I just am so, I love this painting. I love this illustration. And I think I'm probably influenced as an artist by him and how he does skies mm -hmm. and how he has the audacity to throw colors in it that you don't, wouldn't think of. Almost very Asian. Almost very Asian, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So the, there's others of his, um, and I love this one. So and it's Adventure. Is that Tom great Sawyer? Great Adventure. It's what? Is that Tom Sawyer? What is that? I don't know what okay. it is. I, I really don't. I think it's it's just a... Um, Robinson Crusoe. Or something yeah, like something that. like that. Yeah, but it, awesome. But it's... But you can see... You can see how he creates... The spirit of adventure. You want to be on that rock with that guy. And then the book that, as uh, a child, that influenced my life because my father read to us mm -hmm. when we went to uh, on vacations in Baja, California. Um, they didn't have electricity, and so we, by lantern light, he read to us oh, wow. books, and this is The Yearling, Yearling by yeah. Marjorie Kenan Rollins. Yeah. And he has a whole series of illustrations for these. And this is um, Jody, yeah. Jody Baxter with Flag the Deer, The Yearling. And um, he, I, I didn't know it until I was adult, but he affected my, my development in childhood. Mm. Because he brought me into this wonderful world. Interesting. Along with my, and it reminds me of my dad, and mm -hmm. my dad is in heaven with Jesus now. But, and, um, and so he is from, N.C. Wyeth is from the School of Illustration by Howard Pyle, who actually is the one, if you've read a Robin Hood story, it was by is Howard it? Pyle. Okay. And he is the one who did it. And so, there's many, many artists that have been influenced by him. And most of these artists painted some in books, but mostly for magazines and magazine stories, when stories were in magazines. But, as I'm told, when he illustrated Treasure Island, um, he it paid for his studio and his house. I bet it did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. So, so N.C. Wyeth is, is, is one of my... Is 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 one of my guys, and I'll never I'll never back away. He will always be in the five. Awesome. So there's probably more money in the illustration gig than there was in the. Oh art. yeah. Yeah. Oh absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And there were opportunities. Yeah. And I mean, and but you had to follow a certain format. Sure. But there's still, if you can find it, well, you know, Norman Rockwell became Norman Rockwell because of oh. Saturday Evening Post. Yeah. So. Very cool. So my next one is similar to your illustration and with the the theme of adventure and Arthurian legends mm -hmm. and such. And that is, let's see, there she is. Oh yeah. So this is the Lady of Shalott by Waterhouse. And I got into this piece in high school. So this is the very first poster I bought that wasn't 
a band. So <laughs> that wasn't a uh, like a, a rock band of some sort. So <laughs> yeah, I I guess it might have even been the first work of art that I bought. But it's romantic and dramatic. Uh. It got me into it. It got me into poetry. Um, I don't know what it was about this one, but it just it really drew me in and sucked me in. Um, listen, listen to Lorena McKennett. Yeah, Lady of Shalot. Lady of Shalot. I, I love Lorena McKennett too. Yeah. She's a she's a she was a, a little gothic musician she's, in the nineties. She's and something fascinating, fabulous. Um, so I like I like this this genre of ro romantic romanticized paintings that came out of the pre-raphaelite era mm -hmm. um and again i it it's not the illustrations but it was all the stories that uh -huh. that these artists were telling uh -huh. either the arthurian or the bible stories yeah and uh and I, it, it it's and it's it's the feelings yes that come about yes and i there's i oh man this is this is gorgeous look at Look at the boat, first of all. Mm -hmm. And the boat has details of it. Yep. And I don't. I I think it's a quilt. That's cool. Whatever it is. That's hanging over yeah. it. I think it's a quilt, a mm -hmm. tapestry or something. Tapestry. Yeah. But and I see there's a yearning. Yeah, and there's that. I mean, getting back to brokenness, like this gal's broken and she's been betrayed, and uh -huh. he just nails it. So she does. she's like a high school girl that just got dumped, and, and it's awesome. Have, have, but have we all yes. been in that situation? Yes, and I, I think that's probably why I was drawn to it as a late teen into my 20s, yeah. just dealing with, you know, romantic failures and rejections and all mm -hmm. this kind of stuff. You could, yeah, that it communicates. You know she's hurting. You know she's been, re she's been turned down. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That we, and again, I've not the poster, but I've seen, I've seen that landscape somewhere. That landscape is, I mean, not not yeah. the painting itself, but that real life landscape. Yeah, yeah. The color of the hills in the background, mm -hmm. and oh, it's it's beautiful. Yeah, clearly England. Good somewhere. job. Thank Good you. job. Thank you. Um, of course, my guy is Jackson Pollock. Mm -hmm. And he's my. He was he was my one of my runner ups. Okay. Yeah, he didn't make the he, cut though. Uh, Jackson Pollock uh, uh, informed uh, my my adult renaissance. I had a I I have in my forties. I had an adult renaissance. I came out of a sense of brokenness, mm -hmm. um, and uh, in as a. I, I came out of ministry just very broken and had to basically start at rock bottom. Mm -hmm. It was my rock bottom. Got it. As God brought me up out of that dark place, lots of things that I was closed off to because it just wasn't proper yeah. as, as a Christian. To like them and to enjoy them, it's when I began to enjoy wine, good wine. Oh. The finer things in life, huh? F finer things. Yes. I mean, I I I began to um, I just be you know I know all the rules about drinking and the yeah. and it's clear and the Bible was there. Um, the rules are appropriate. Yeah. But at the same time, it doesn't mean no. Yeah. God says we think God says no, and God doesn't say no a lot of times. He's just saying, just, yeah, just be good, be cool, and so. And so part of that is, and then um, brought my wife, my my wonderful Sue, into my life, and all of a sudden Sue and I are going to going to clubs and listening to jazz. Mm. Oh no! <laughs> and I I didn't yeah, yeah. I was closed off to jazz. Jeez. Why? Because because I didn't understand what it was doing, and why musically I didn't understand that. I didn't know what it was, wow. and and you know it didn't have a tune that I could whistle to. And I was wrong. Interesting. And so the same thing when the visual arts. is visual art is I began to explore and love abstract expressionism. Yeah. So explain so, this 
I, I, I scrambled I, egg. Other than the fact that mess. I just loved it, and it's scrambled yes. eggs, and it's a mess, and it's art, and it's it's a perfect example of art for art's sake. Yeah, it's just in for painting's sake. Now Jackson Pollock and all his other things, and and if you can go continue on, if you can, um, and all his stuff. See, yeah. I like this in the I color. So good. And okay, so one thing you can't get from this on the screen is the scale of it. Oh, they're huge. Huge. They're, they, he painted in his studio, which on the floor, yeah. which would be absolutely the length of, of this. Yeah. And he bent over. Pollock is very controversial because he's, he's a bad dude. He, was, <laughs> he struggled with alcoholism yeah. all his life. He, um, he cheated on his wife. Um, he was somewhat abusive. And um, the um, the the Pollock portrayal by Ed Harris so in good. the movie Pollock so, was so good, but pretty true. Pretty true. <laughs> I, it, and and so w what we run into then it, the difficult we run run into as Christians is how can you appreciate from bad guys, bad people? You know, he yeah. was he wasn't a good dude. To me, my approach is this is he is, God is working mm. through his creative process, through, the, through that gift that he put into Pollock to touch me yeah. and, to, and to eliminate the boundaries I put in my life yeah. and give me the freedom to express. Mm -hmm. in many ways and that's why I like so I love this one right. I just was attracted to the examples I have attracted to the colors and I love the examples of this the next one is I love the simplicity of this and just yeah I just I love it and then the next one and this is you know the yeah. red the predominant and and I just and look at that this is probably my favorite and I wanted it to be the last because I know you love like green. green look at that yeah, and once again, they're huge. Huge. Um, so, I mean, if you're looking at it, and if you're if you're just listening, Jackson Pollock's a bunch of squiggly. Oh, paint. he's the dripping. He's the dripping. He and there was a movie that came out not too long ago called "Who the F Is Jackson Pollock?" Did uh -huh. you see that? Yeah. About some no, lady. I haven't seen it yet. Okay, so it's about the, some lady that bought a Jackson Pollock at a thrift store, and she had no idea what she had. Oh, wow. She, she got it for like five bucks or something like oh, that. Oh, my goodness. And somebody's like, you have a Jackson Pollock? And she's like, well, you know. She was going to like repurpose the canvas or something no. like that. So anyway, it's a, great, it's a great little story. But the thing is, a lot of people are like, I don't get it. Right? So the there's like... My, my two-year-old can do this. Well, no, Well, I the can't. point is, yeah, yeah your two-year-old can do it. Yeah. But he's he did. Yes. He's the first one. He's the first one went out there and said, you know what? I'm yeah. gonna do this. Yeah. And I'm gonna do it. Uh, if you're able to look at this painting, do you know the name of this one? I don't know. This the one's name great. Of it. But this is this is cla classic Pollock, right? Yeah. And then it, the depth of it is like if you, I want to encourage everybody to go find yourself a real Jackson Pollock and, and look the, at it. And look at it. In the flesh, they have them. They have them at LACMA. Do they? Yes. Yeah. And they're so they're so deep because he's just layering, paint, you know, drip upon drip and upon drip, and it almost feels like the canvas is three feet deep. Uh huh. It's it's fascinating. And if you like, if you if if you need your art to, to be defined for you, yeah, Pollock's not your guy. Pollock's not sure. your guy. But he defined. An artistic expression in the fifties and sixties. Absolutely. So, like this piece here, um, I don't. I wish I knew what that was called. I forgot. I, I who knows? Like probably like number one or number two or something like yeah, that. Yeah, the, right? the yellow know. one's number two. Yeah. So, like this work was eventually reproduced in shopping malls and on merchandising materials mm -hmm. and maybe even wrapping paper wrapping paper <laughs> so like we don't really recognize pollock's influence on culture and well, whether it translated into uh, how, how we've how we've expressed our our um aesthetic specifically well, I, in the I, 50s I, and I 60s. think in modern art we don't in, 
Yeah. I mean, that he's a strong voice in term in in modern art, and um, we don't see classical paintings now in modern buildings. No. We don't see the. Yeah. the we see the abstracts. And, we see the abstracts, yeah. and we see lots of colors yeah. and lots of shapes, and um, and you know, um, again, it's not everybody's cup of tea. But what I what Pollock has meant to me and meant to my faith, yeah, is freedom. Yeah. And freedom in the sense, freedom of expression. I can be who God created us to be. Cultural Christianity yeah. as or religious Christianity as defined by church culture yeah. can be very binding. Yes. And it can and it also can be very unforgiving. Yes. And so in one sense what I saw in Pollock when I embraced him and said I like him mm -hmm. and I like what he does. Yeah. Um, it it made me love the very very broken man. <laughs> yeah. Very broken. And I, and I, that it honestly the Pollock and then my abstract expression it's getting into our idea what we're trying to flesh out here in this podcast is the art of faith. Mm -hmm. That okay, well let's just take all the the pretty pictures out, out of it. Um, the way that I approach my faith and the way that you approach your faith, they're uniquely different, and God mm -hmm. likes them both. And loves them both. Loves them both. Um, you're a Baptist, I'm a charismatic, but we have our baseline in who Jesus is. And That's a non-negotiable. It's non-negotiable. And so everything else is an expression, and... I think what the the American church need, probably the church around the world needs, is that we need to celebrate each other's unique expressions of faith, and be okay with it. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I shouldn't try to convert you. <laughs> I I have somebody in my church. She's like, she has she comes from another tradition, so she does church with us, but then she also does mm -hmm. church somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Because she loves her traditions, and, mm -hmm. and and she's like, somebody's trying to convert me, Pastor Josh. I just, I love my tradition. I love that expression, but I also love the the contemporary music here. I love them both. Why can't I have them both? I'm like, you can have them both. You, you don't are, need to be of converted. You, can. you don't need to be converted. You don't need to adopt a no. cultural Christianity, right? And that's and it, that's the thing. That's the thing. And so if you know it. <clears throat> You know, maybe a church. Every church needs to hang a Pollock in the in the right? narthex or yeah. in the in the welcome center. Yeah, whatever it is. Just simply mix it, it up a little bit. Huh? It's an expression of, yeah. of freedom. Yeah. And and how how do I, you know, well, how can I accept somebody like Pollock? Do what Jesus does and just yeah. love him. Well, and I'm pretty sure that Jesus would have hung out with Pollock. Show me. Yeah. Show me what you're doing. He'd be there. He'd be there. Absolutely. He'd be there. I would say, this is so neat. Go okay, ahead. so um, I, I was always hung up on the classics and, you know, the romantics mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. um, the ancients. And so I kind of had a, uh, a poo-poo attitude towards modern art and abstract expression. And so I just, I didn't really care about it didn't really like it. And, and I then, was there too. Yeah. And then I kind of had this attitude that, well, I can do that. But again, it's kind of like what you said. It's kind of like saying, well, I could write an Elvis song. It's basic. Well, you didn't. Elvis really. But you, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You didn't do you it. You didn't do it. He did. So, and I and seeing the Pollocks and the other abstract expressions in books and stuff, it, on it, it does not do it just justice. Uh, but when I was working at the Seattle Art Museum, I was a security guard at the Seattle Art Museum. Did you know that? I, I, no, but okay, I... Okay, you're not surprised. I, no, I'm okay. not surprised. Okay. <laughs> um, so I had to walk the galleries. and um, Lucky you. I, I fell in love with abstract expressionism. Pollock was probably the first because, again, I was like mm -hmm. drawn in, like sucked into the depth mm -hmm. of the painting. Uh, Motherwell was another great one that I liked a lot. Just... You know, like the Rorschachs, and I'm like, I'm like, why do I like this? 
But this is just a black smudge. Yeah. Why do I like this? And uh, the Roth goes with the big giant, you know, banners of color, and again, ginormous. They just sucked me in. Yeah. They 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 did something. And being in the gallery did something than, than rather than seeing them in the books. Yeah. And. Um, and so mine is is a contemporary. So you just you just gave a great endorsement for museums. I get it, I did. You just endorsed <laughs> I, 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 Go to I, your, go to a museum. Go go visit the real thing. Yeah. So mine is contemporary. So this is Jasper Johns. So what? If you're listening, uh, it's basically just a picture of a target. Um, a little bit after abstract expressionists, uh, so a little closer to our time, but in. Some would say in the abstract expression category, but just big, giant, bright colors. I don't know why I like it. Primary colors. Primary colors, and then he mo he he used he focused pretty much just on these shapes and these objects, and he would work them over and over and over again. Right. So he just did a, Jasper Johns did a ton of targets. Um, so very icon like iconography was a big theme for him. So like the the whole logo aspect of that piece. I, I don't know why. I don't. I just again. Yeah. I can't really even explain why I liked yeah, to, it. I can't even say to that those it, who are listening, it's basically a a yellow and blue Target logo. Yeah. For it's Target logo. Shooters. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it's but it's more than that, and we're selling it wrong because there's so there's within the colors there's there's textures and layers and and different brush strokes coming yeah. in on it. And then the other piece, this is the other piece that he did. He worked American flags over and over and over again. And uh, now, I, it, I don't know if I like it because it's patriotic. I'm a, I mean, I consider myself a patriot. I love my country. But I don't think that's why that he was painting no. American flags over and over and over again. So these are, again, this issue well, of depth. And then we're, we're kind of getting into pop art here. So we're, yeah. we're, we're going to be, it's transitioning into... Uh, the Warhol ideas of art. Now, that's a flat painting, right? No, there's there are multiple canvases. Okay, so he's, the, he's layered the canvases. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, so he's okay. got he's got three American flags in different sizes layered on top of one another, and I I think honestly he's doing it for the iconography of it. I, yeah. I can't say that he was. A, you know, an American flag waving type of a guy. No, He's I don't think so either. I mean, I so. would because first of all, everything of those two, two examples that you you showed of these, this and the target, um, primary colors are just I, mm -hmm. I just love primary colors. Number one, and um, uh, stripes. Red and white stripes and the stars and stripes, I don't care, are cool. Yeah. They're just cool. Yeah, yeah. There's something fun about them. Yeah. There's something, it, it, it's, I, when I, in a lot of my S backwards paintings, I mm -hmm. do a rendering of the stars and the stripes somewhere yeah. in that. Yeah. I just love it. Yeah. And I, and I think that's fascinating because kind of like with your S backwards series, yeah. like he was just doing targets and flags. Like, and we would just, we would display them and we'd, and like, but you can see the process yeah. of him working it out. Like, yeah. And I don't even know quite, quite sure what he's trying to say. But, but I mean. There, the basic, it, it, what did, what, what did, let me speak for yeah. people, for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who do these things. Who take a iconic symbol and, and work it and work it and work it and work it and see what's there and asking the questions. Yeah. And um, and that's that's exactly what's going on. What can I do with this? How yeah. can I how can I manipulate this? It's just coming in today. I was listening to um, to one of my favorite composers, Bach. Oh yeah. And and he has a piece that I've listened to over and over again um, called a Variations on a Theme from Handel. Da 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 da. Mm -hmm. And then just blows it up, blows it up, yeah. and tell it, and he brings it back home. I love that, yeah. and I think that you know if I were if I were to name this um, variations on a theme of American flag, yeah. yeah, variations on a theme of basic shapes that we see every day. Yeah. It's awesome. 
Cool, huh? Yeah. All right, so there's our top five. Not for me. The, oh, I you got, have another one? I got my last oh, one. That's right, huh? Where is um, Wallace? My, my Hillary top Knight. artist is an illustrator by the name of Hillary Knight. And I didn't know that Hillary Knight was a huge part of what I loved as a child growing up and going to school. Mm. Um, my teachers, you know, they read books to us, remember? Right. My teachers, <laughs> every year, one of my teachers, every year somebody read me um, Mrs. Pickle Wiggle. Remember those stories? Yeah. Read Mrs. Pickle Wiggle, illustrated by Hillary Knight. Um, and, and, and many other books I would look and say, Hillary and I didn't know how it was important. This book was so influential on me as a child. And I think that if I, if God hadn't got a hold of my life and made me a pastor and made me love him and want to love ministry, I would have been an illustrator because mm. it influenced my life. This book, Where's Wallace, is, um, and, and his other books that I, I love and enjoy, and they all have the same sort of, he, I call them hidden treasures. He puts hidden treasures mm. in his books. That's cool. And Where's Wallace? He did a rendition of the 12 Days of Christmas and the Owl and the Pussycat. Mm -hmm. And these, the cover's only half of it. In Where's Wallace, and the reason why I loved this is he has these beautiful panoramic um, pictures throughout his book, and here's the 12 Days of mm, Christmas. That's very sweet. And in this one, the reason why I love this, when this one, um, it tells a story. It just is just this, the lyrics. All okay. it is is the lyrics on the first day of Christmas. Well, what's happening is the male bear is bringing gifts to, to his girlfriend. And so you see him in the first page, on the first day Aww. of Christmas, my Trula gave to me a partridge in a pear tree. He's going to her house, Got it. carrying a partridge, and there's a partridge in a pear tree. Well, what the beauty of this is, <laughs> is every day when he comes, he brings two calling birds and a partridge in a pear tree. So the first day is one partridge in a pear tree. So and then there's know. another partridge in a pear tree. So there's 12 partridges in a pear tree. Oh. And it multiplies. And so when you look in these illustrations all around, you see what she does with these gifts. Mm. <laughs> and all of a sudden she has, she has all these chickens and all these birds. It's delightful. I'm going to leave them with you. Okay. Yes. Because I want you to be delighted. I will be delighted. By them. Absolutely. And in Where's Wallace? The story is Wallace, who's in the trash can, escapes from the zoo. <laughs> He's an orangutan. Okay. And he escapes from the zoo. Every time. And everybody, Where's Wallace? Where'd he go? Goes to the museum, goes to the ball game, yeah, goes yeah, to the yeah. beach. Yeah, yeah. And in these panoramas, you have to do. You have you to find, to him, find him. Yeah. Just it was it was where's Waldo before where's Over Waldo? Waldo, got it, got it. And then, but then I discovered as a child, as I was looking at these beautiful things, that there were f five or six other images that he hid in these panoramas. Didn't tell anybody. Wow. And as a kid, I found, you found I them? said, oh, these, wait a minute. Oh, there she is. There he is. There's a baby. There's a little girl. And there's a, a bass player, a cello player. Mm. And, um, and, and so I, he blew up my imagination. He blew up my wonder. That's cool. You, you once asked me if I thought illustrators were artists. I'm like, oh, man, this is a trick question. Thankfully, I answered correctly, yeah. and I said yes. They are. And for those of you that don't know, there's some snooty artists out there that <laughs> think that only their political agenda-fueled art is the only real art, and that illustrators are not technically artists. But, but art, especially if you go way back, yeah. what, do you, what do you think the ancients were trying to do? Yeah. Illustrate their life. Yes. Illustrate a hunt. 
Yes. What do you think Michelangelo is trying yeah. to do? Illustrate the Bible. Yeah. Please. Absolutely. So I I hope we do a, a segment on a podcast on Where's Wallace. So here's we will do it for sure. Yeah. Here, okay. Here's all these books Yay. that are influenced. Enjoy I, and just just my goodness. Give yourself time for these. Mm. I have the I have Twelve Days of Christmas in hardbound. Okay. Right. Are, are we ready for a prophetic word? A okay. Prophetic word. So I've been praying about this, yeah. and um, and. Um, and when I started looking for it, first of all, I went to N.C. Wyeth, and, and I thought I was going to, oh, this is, this is, this is it. But I found myself, when we, when we do prophetic things, you can't force it. Yeah, I agree. Because then you're like saying, this is what I think. No, you can't force it. And I found myself forcing this. I thought there was a lot of spirituality in this for you and stuff like that, like in, in this particular painting of of the uh, um, of King Arthur at the lake I love this yeah him standing getting in there and I love the swans yeah. the three swans the symbols of the yeah, Holy Spirit it. so I give you this wonderful but that's not it I have another one another prophetic word well, I don't know you do have another one I do okay this is um, and if we can go to the to the last one there, there. this is the one that I was, that I didn't, I didn't feel that this was true prophetic. This was me trying to interpret this one right away. And this is the prophetic word. First of all, it's a beautiful painting. Yeah. This is a picture of Jesus. There are a lot of paintings like this that are attributed to Rembrandt. This is a Rembrandt to Jesus. Um, this is what scholars can authenticate as genuinely being his. Okay. And the re this is, I'll, I'll tell you the uh, prophetic word in just a minute. Um, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. The things in his clothes are br brush strokes. There's economy of brush strokes all over that place. Yeah. Um, Rembrandt painted in the Jewish quarter. He lived in the Jewish quarter of the Netherlands. Mm. So this is a Jewish man. This is a Jewish man. Yeah. This is not a European man. Yeah. This is a this is a Jewish man. It's not a Europe is not a European white man. Yeah. <laughs> and he is he looks mid Eastern. Mm -hmm. Now the word is this. The Lord is blessed and pleased that you are bringing the reality of who Jesus is to the kingdom of God, yeah. for the kingdom of God. That you are presenting me without comment, mm. <laughs> just as I am. in my humanity, in my divinity, and, and you are presenting me as a Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. Someone everyone can approach and love. God is, God is pleased mm -hmm. <laughs> with your work. Thank you. God is pleased and focus in on the eyes yeah, and no, see that. That's so good. I, yeah, well, I, 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 I kind of snuck a peek and I saw it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope that's it. And that was it. Yeah. I, I try to represent Jesus as purely as I can. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I both know that we bring our interpretations of who we want Jesus to be mm -hmm. into the pulpit, and that's illegal for us to do. It, it happens. Yeah. But trying to find 
it. One of the ways that I was taught how to preach is that, yes, you're to give information, you're to give the word, you're to give inspiration, mm -hmm. you know, you allow the Holy Spirit to bring uh, correction. He says, but your number one job in the pulpit is to recognize that Jesus is standing next to you, and yet he's invisible to your congregation. Mm -hmm. So you have to illustrate that Jesus is standing right next to you. Mm -hmm. And that bit of advice actually actually came from the Robert Schuller, uh, Robert Schuller School of Preaching. <laughs> uh, that bit of advice, I was like, okay, today I'm going to try and illustrate who Jesus is to these people in everything that I say. I don't mm -hmm. always... I mean, you know this. We don't always hit it. Yeah. But I don't think... I mean, if I made Jesus the way that I wanted him to be, mm -hmm. well, I don't think that that would be... <laughs> we'd, have a, we'd have a very... I, it, it would be a, a counterfeit. Of, and so the yeah. prophetic word is, yeah. you don't. Yes. Yeah. You don't do that. Yeah. But I just... Okay, so if you're listening and not watching, uh, Google Rembrandt Jesus. Jesus. It's just a portrait of him looking sideways. He's not even looking at you. He's looking at someone else. And but, his head is a, is is yeah. on a tilt. But he cares, and he's engaged, and it's just a very powerful painting. And he's real. It's real. And this is a. There's real, no halo. Yeah. This there's is a real man. There's no, um, there's no uh, crown of thorns on yeah. his head. He's a real, real man. Yeah. And if you have the opportunity to see this, I hope that you will be. My my hope is that beyond, beyond the painting itself, you will be drawn into this person of Christ. Yeah. This person who. It's changed the world. Yeah. So thank you for this. You're welcome. I it's just I mean does, it really does speak to me. Does it ring with you? A then? Absolutely. Truth. Absolutely. Good. Yeah. Almost was this. <laughs> or I like this one too. <laughs> but no, this this really felt like it was God speaking to yes, me. Yes, it it and it was. Yeah. That's the one. And for okay, just I, I, we'll we'll close. I'll have you close in prayer, okay. But um, I want to encourage you to allow God to speak to you this week and even right now. And yes, crack your Bible or yes, bow your knees. But maybe God is going to speak to you prophetically. Maybe there will be a freshly spoken word of God. Um, again, there's an art to this thing. There is absolute truth. There's non-negotiables. The man, Jesus, is our non-negotiable. Non-negotiable. He is, he is the more than worthy to go into relationship with and to gaze into his eyes. So. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be cool if we go to heaven and Rembrandt got it right? And I, well, I think that that... that and Rembrandt got it right. And, yeah. then he, and that, you know, this is just fun to play with. And he actually painted it in the spirit. What a great thought to think. Huh? What a great thought to think. I mean, yeah. That is, Wouldn't that be cool? That would be cool. Wow. All right. Close us in prayer, Joel. Lord Jesus, what a glorious, glorious Lord you are. And what a glorious opportunity it is to speak of beauty and to speak of. of of what you are able to do through the hands of very flawed people mm -hmm. to bring beauty into the world and in one sense insert your truth in uncanny places, in unexpected places. Lord, be with all those who hear our voices and I pray that um, your blessing would flow upon them. And we give you the glory in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessings on you all. See you next time. God bless.